rapid 2023, we see companies that make equipment, materials, service providers, many different angles on additive manufacturing. But you know, Jable, that's a company which used to be thought of as the biggest company no one's ever heard of. A gigantic contract manufacturer that is probably in the pockets of almost every American that has a piece of personal electronics. But they're actually now developing materials. I'm with Luke Rogers, he's Senior Director of R&D for Jable. Uh, Luke, it's materials. Now that is not at all what we would think of as something that Jable would be getting into. How did that come about? Uh, the, the materials investment for around added manufacturing happened about five years ago where we started initially uh, creating a materials innovation center just to enable the ecosystem for us to develop materials fast and at a rapid pace for our customers. So that's how it originated and, and where we're at now is we're making custom materials, for example, for KAV. Uh, a customer had a request for a very specific impact resistance at, at very low temperatures. So we developed a custom made uh, material specifically for that helmet application for them as, as a service. Now that's, a, that's a, a point well taken because everyone can work with commodity polymers and there are a lot of different ways to make things a commodity polymer. So if you want to use additive to make um, a medium, volume, medium production run mold and then send it to an injection molder, you can do that. You're talking about some applications here that involve things like low temperature impact resistance, barrier properties. I mean that's a whole different world, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, we don't just make plastics into powders, right? So we make actual products out of our materials. So we're not just grinding materials and, and saying they're additively uh, manufacturable. We go through a very rigorous process around how we generate our powders, how repeatable our powder manufacturing processes are, and the actual printing of the of, of the parts at our facilities, uh, all the way through physical property testing and even barrier property testing, like you mentioned. We have quite a few applications for our new Polyketone 5000 product that we, uh, that we sell into the powder bed fusion processes, um, uh, specifically around uh, fuel tanks and high barrier uh, requirements for either drones or, or, or low off automotive parts or even things like weed whippers and, and just general small engine um, manufacturing of, of fuel tanks. It's a great application using additive, but once you get something like PK5000 that has the great barrier properties, you can actually use it in end use application. Now we've all heard of PEAK, polyether ketone, perhaps the most popular sort of, of member of that family. Tell me about your PK5000. Yeah, so the, the most people when they think of polyketones, they think of the aromatic polyketones, right? Like PEAK and PEC uh, materials, and there are additive manufacturing versions of those in filament and powder form. Our polyketone product is an aliphatic version, so it's a lower temperature material. It prints at the exact same uh, printing temperatures as a PA12 or a PA11, so it can be um, utilized in historical DTM type systems or 3D systems type systems or EOS or far soon. So it's, a, it's widely available on those types of uh, platforms and uh, it's got exceptional ductility and, and impact resistance compared to a lot of the traditional materials. So I think one area that we're really getting a lot of interest in is in the automotive OEMs. Because of the high level of ductility, especially in the Z-axis, um, it's very hard for us to get uh, uh, any of our, our tensile uh, bars to break under 10% elongation at break, which most materials do not get anywhere near that. But for PK5000, that's the, the base, and, and it just gets better from there as far as elongation at break and stability of the, our materials. So it's, it's a really unique material in that perspective is that uh, you can build a, a large part and still have a very, very ductile material. Yeah, I mean, you can uh, design a, a part with good impact resistance by using even a commodity TPU or, or thermoplastic elastomer, but if you're talking about a wide temperature range, it's really hard at 20 below zero to get something that has any crush. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, compared to uh, you know, a lot of the elastomerics out there or the propylenes, I think it's a, a really good, unique combination of chemical resistances, uh, lubricity, impact toughness. It kind of hits a, a sweet, sto uh, sweet spot between the polyamides as far as very similar strength uh, to polyamides, very similar modulus and chemical resistance to polypropylenes and it's got the high lubricity and wear resistance of, a, of an acetyl or palm type material. So these polyketones, it's a really unique polymer. Uh, it does really well in injection molding and traditional processes against palms and, and higher temperature nylon products. Um, so it, it's bringing that material to additive manufacturing just opens up a lot of application spaces for a, a unique plastic like that. Can an engineer that's used to working with it, the classic polyamides, you know, the old nylons, the six, the six six, you know, twelve, uh, do they have the knowledge base they need to adapt these materials and just get, hit the ground running? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I think that in general, the, the nylons that most people think about are six and six six, and the, the typical 
polymers that we're using in additive manufacturing don't have quite that temperature uh, resistances of the PA uh, of sixes and six six. It's just uh, the, the function of the, the melt temperature of those plastics. And due to the historically, most of these powder bed fusion processes have been built around PA twelve. They have the same types of chemical resistance or temperature resistances, I should say, of PA twelve. So the polyketone product doesn't really have a, a six or a six six temperature resistance. It's got very similar to a twelve temperature resistance. Um, and then just overall, the amount of physical properties and, and nuances of, of additive uh, materials versus six, um, it is a little bit more uh, anisotropic. So you do need to make sure you're taking into account for that. But if you do, if you do, you know, plan for your part to be made via additive manufacturing, and you do go through the design allowables and the characteristics of these plastics, they absolutely can be used in, in, in end use parts for either automotive or aerospace processes, especially with how advanced these manufacturing platforms are getting. Uh, your, the barrier properties are quite exciting. You mentioned, of course, that the, the small engine fuel tank is an example down here. Uh, compared to blow molding, uh, blow molding is a wonderful high volume uh, production process, but you can't do things like internal baffling, but you're 3D printing. Could you conceptually, for example, put integral baffling into a fuel tank? Absolutely. I don't see why not. I mean, the, the only limitation around fuel tanks is that you have to get the powders out. <laughs> so, and if you're w willing to do, uh, you know, ultrasonic welding or, or there's other up, there's other ways to make a fuel tank and put it together as well, right? So we can make half shells and, and fuel them together. But uh, the hardest part is getting out the powders. So, but that's you know, there's there's several processes out there that uh, do a really good job of bringing powders out of these types of um, powder bed fusion processes. So, the sky's the limit when it comes to integration of of, of new baffling or, or geometries for added manufacturing when you get a material that is truly chemically resistant and robust enough to actually be used in the end-use application you're using. Now these end-use applications you described are, are quite high volume consumer goods. Do you anticipate this technology is going to be a true production volume thing? Is this going to replace blow molding or injection molding, do you think, for those, those kinds of like large production volumes? Um, you know, there's, uh, added manufacturing is a tool in the toolbox, right? So it's always going to have its specific place, and I believe that there's absolutely going to be some end use and production runs that are the right volume, but it's on a part by part basis. I mean, you're never going to completely get rid of roto molding, right? Roto molding is a great, great way of making parts. Um, you're also not going to get rid of blow molding, right? But there are certain aspects, certain geometries, certain parts that should be made out of additive manufacturing. And we're here to make sure that if it should be, then we can make it out of additive manufacturing processes. Luke, everyone's talking about sustainability today. The idea is, of course, to reduce carbon footprint, basically reduce the environmental impact of this. How do these new materials play into that? Well, uh, our polyketone material is a carbon sequestering technology. Um, so we actually put carbon monoxide into the backbone of the polymer. So that's great for overall um, carbon emissions. We also have a brand new product, uh, our PLA product, which is the first uh, polylactic acid that is uh, a polymer that's for powder bed fusion processes. It's by far the most common used uh, polymer for FFF technologies, but this is the first powder-based uh, technology system. Um, that polymer is 100% uh, um, uh, sustainable as far as the resources that it's utilizing to make the, the, the base polymer. Those are based off of sugars, so either corn-based products or, or, or other uh, um, um, either corn-based products or other materials that are used for uh, sugars or can, can be used to produce that, that, that polymer. So. Um, so the PLA material is 100% um, biosourced. It is also uh, a compostable, an industrially compostable product um, with significantly lower carbon emissions than a, than a PA12 product. So it's really a, um, a very sustainable material. And at Jable, we're taking sustainability very seriously. Our CEO, um, our new CEO, Kenny uh, Wilson, just started uh, uh, officially uh, as the new CEO. We announced a transition, but he announced uh, we actually started that transition on Monday, and his first announcement to the customer, uh, to the entire company internally, was about sustainability and how much that is going to be meaningful for our customers and for our future of our of our company, and making sure that we're doing the right thing for our customers and for the environment. At Rapid TCT 2023, the air was electric. The excitement about manufacturing in America is palpable. New technologies, new ways of implementing additive manufacturing, not just for prototyping, but as a true production process, were all over this show floor. The future looks very bright for manufacturing in America based on what we have seen here. Thanks for joining us on the show floor. See you next time. Today's episode is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.com TV today.